Uh, well, it's it's great to have um, Hans Sittig back again. Um, this is actually the second time we've recorded this interview because the first time we recorded it, um, I dropped my external hard drive onto the ground uh, when I tripped over a wire and lost all of my videos and all of my photos. And it was my main backup drive. And uh, so unfortunately, one of the interviews that I lost was Hans's one that we had already done. So we're doing it for a second time, but um, but uh, I think um, uh, that will probably be to our advantage because there were a lot of things that we wanted to cover in the in that interview and that we 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 forgot to cover. So, Hans, welcome back for uh, what a fourth yeah. session, hey? Um, okay. Let's see how far we get today. Looking forward to hearing what you what you want to tell us uh, about the end of the war and the beginning of the new Zimbabwean era. Okay, right. Uh, to start off with. Um... I'm going to finish off a, a, a few things uh, to do with the war. Um, uh, first uh, is um, uh, my father-in-law, Uwam um Ben, uh, was killed in a, uh, uh, an ambush on Battlefields Ranch. Uh, Sorry, if I could just interject there and say, we did interview Jan Stander. Who yeah. was, was that Uwam um Ben's son? No, um, Jan Stander um, is the son of uh, Janni uh, uh, Stander, Um Ben's brother. So he's okay. the nephew. Yeah. So, so Um they Ben had, is Jan's uncle. Uh, that's right. They had adjoining ranches. Um Ben had battlefields. And um, uh, jointly, they owned a ranch next door called Ben Johnny, being basically Ben and yeah. Jan. Yeah. And um, uh, uh, um, he, he grew up on, on uh, Ben Johnny. But the the two families obviously you know uh, being brothers are uh, very close yeah and um, uh, basically he would have been uh, witness to to all that happened yeah yeah okay um Uwam ben was uh, killed in an ambush uh, during 1979 um and he was actually pregnant at the time with our daughter natasha and uh, he was killed in an ambush on battlefields ranch um, driving one of those VW mind-proof vehicles, I forget now what they were called. Um, he, he was in the company of a youngster who was a friend of the family called Charlie Brown. And uh, yes, they were ambushed and they were both killed. What happened then is, um, firstly, um, Annie and Titch uh, flew down to uh, Fort Vic where they viewed the body. Um, uh, it was a trying time for all of us. And um, I was then asked to basically close down uh, Battlefields Ranch. Um, oh, it's a sad thing. Uh, first of all, I'm going in uh, during, towards the end of the war into one of the hottest areas uh, in the country. So uh, I took leave and I went around all my friends from the war. And I said, guys, I need volunteers um, because I cannot do this alone. And oh, so many guys volunteered. I took I took twenty guys with me. Um, basically, in nineteen seventy nine, um, I was working with um, uh, uh, special projects. Well, I was I shared a base with them. Uh, I wasn't working with them, but I had full access to the armory. So I equipped these guys with who bloody name it. We had a bit RPG sevens. We had RPDs. We had PKMs. Um, and of course, I, I had my RPK, and um, we had um, uh, uh, one, uh, the family, the Sander family, owned a, a bit for truck, so um, uh, we took that and we took the seats out and uh, we put sandbags in instead of the seats, to, you know, just in case we hit the tin, and um, we got uh, another uh, uh, Bedford uh, from Special Forces, so we, we had two five-ton Bedfords. <laughs> the private car. Um, we went down to New Anetsi Police Station, and um, when we got to New Anetsi Police Station, uh, the uh, PO there very kindly uh, gave us use of a croc of a crocodile uh, to add to our little convoy, um, which was very welcome, because um, the road to Battlefields Ranch, the Mataki Hills Road, uh, was well known for having lots of tins on it and and literally um okay it was 
uh, from where the road starts to the ranch is 80 kilometers. And uh, during some stages of those 80 kilometers, you do, you're virtually doing a slalom in between the bloody craters. Okay, when we get when we got there, um, the ranch had a, 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 a GCSB call sign on it called Charlie Charlie. Um, uh, they occupied the second house um, uh, uh, on the on the ranch headquarters, and uh, one man, in order to um, make it easier for the security forces, had built an airstrip uh, just outside, uh, the, just outside the. Um, the headquarters compound. Okay, we get there, and uh, uh, it took us two days to load the trucks. Uh, it included, and of course, I'm a, I'm a bit of a weapons freak, so um, I would notice these things. It included uh, me taking possession of uh, all of uh, Umbin's weapons. One of them was a funny weapon. It was a, a Mauser with a caliber of nine millimeter, but this is a, a the big nine millimeter, yeah? It, it had about 40 rounds of ammo, but I've never seen this ammo before or since. So, yeah, uh, I sold that weapon. And then he had two almost new Brunos. Um, one was a large weapon. It was a 375 Magnum. Um, both weapons had a, a 9 by 3 Weaver scope. And the other one, um, uh, this weapon I still have today, is a 308 Bruno. Um, both weapons had on them what is called a hair trigger. So you set the trigger forward, and then the trigger itself had an insert, so um, uh, it was easy to um, uh, to, to uh, shoot accurately. Now, incidentally, um, I personally had used the the three seven five Magnum earlier during the war. Uh, we had a um, uh, uh, what was the disease called? Um, it's a disease that uh, affects cattle and is carried by buffalo anthrax. We had an anthrax scare on the on the ranch, and uh, Parks, who uh, were fighting this disease, managed to get hold of a helicopter. I went down there and I actually used that Bruno um, to shoot buffalo from the helicopter. <laughs> what is of interest is the kick from this weapon uh, was so large that having fired three or four rounds, you, you ended up with quite a bruise on your shoulder. The Parks guy I was with. He was using a 0.45 Holland and Holland, a twin-barreled weapon. Now, I'd hate to think what his shoulder looked like, you know, but I, I never looked. Okay. So we, uh, I, I took uh, possession of all these weapons, and then uh, uh, we went back. And uh, I must see, I must say uh, Annie was, uh, you yeah, uh, she was quite emotional when we got back. Uh, I suppose so were we all. So, yeah, that, that finishes the, the war chapter. Okay. Now, I've uh, I've come to find that you don't do three interviews like I've done without coming across detractors. You know, there are people out there who doubt whether I was in special branch at all. There are people who doubt the rank I held. Um, uh, and there are uh, people out there who seem to doubt the veracity of what I say. Okay. Um, I can only comment as follows. In terms of my... Um, <laughs> of me being a member of Special Branch, uh, it's quite simply this. Special Branch have a Facebook site. Funnily enough, I'm the admin on that site. Now, only Special Branch members are allowed to be on that site or to vote on that site. Now, how would I become the admin of uh, the Special Branch site without having been a member? Okay. Secondly, uh, as far as my rank is concerned, um, you have to write a um, an exam to become a, a section officer. And I wrote that exam late 78, early 79. And I came fourth out of uh, 200 people who wrote it. In fact, I'm quite proud of. And um, if you look at the book called Blue and Old Gold, uh, which is a book depicting the history of the BSAB from its... Uh, Inception, right through to 1980. At the back of that book is a list of all members who had served and their rank at the time of the book being written. You'll find my name there, and you'll find my rank as DSO, Detective Section Officer. Okay, I, I don't know what else I can say, you know, uh, but I'm pretty certain it proves beyond all doubt 
that um, I am who I say I am. Secondly, as to the veracity, there are all number of people. You, you, I didn't work in a vacuum. You know, all sorts of people worked with me. And you can ask any of these people, whether it's Mike Norton or uh, 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 my old boss, Robin Harvey, is still around. Uh, unfortunately, Danny Stannard has since passed. But um, you can ask any of these people and they will confirm what I've said. Yeah. Yeah. Right. Okay. Where we finished off the last time was um, the various intelligence services uh, uh, competing uh, to obtain a measure of control of the newly formed CIO. Basically, the intelligence services were the CIA, um, then uh, MI6 uh, from the UK. Uh, Boss wasn't really competing, they were already there. And uh, the Bundesnachrichten deeds, the BND, uh, being the, the German Secret Service. Um, right, of those three, the BND um, was the one that spent the most money. Um, they brought in, for starters, 45 VW Golfs and five five series BMWs. The VW Golfs went out to all the CIO stations and the senior guys got the 5 Series BMW. So Danny Stenhout got one. Another 5 Series BM went to a guy called Tyman Guva Masoswe, who was a senior CIO member and ex Zandler guy. That's the other loss of the week. Um, uh, uh, this oak um, got absolutely drunk and wrapped the vehicle around a, a lamppost and walked away from it. So, yeah, that BM didn't last too long. Um, then the Germans brought in one of the first uh, fast computers uh, in Zimbabwe. Now, in those days, uh, the units, they, they were the size of cupboards, close cupboards, you know. And there were a number of units. I think there were six or seven of them. And they had to operate in a special environment. So on the fifth floor where our registry was, they built a room within the building uh, that was enclosed. And because they had to operate at low temperature and in clean air, um, the country's only clean air system was installed. The air inside that room was uh, was uh, was free of everything, free of germs, you bloody name it. Um, the temperature was low. Um, they had to operate, I think it was about, 12 or 14 degrees C. So uh, uh, some very strong air conditioning units had to be installed in order for to enable these computers to operate because um, the operation generated a, a lot of heat. In order to enter the room, it was almost like a space station, you had to go through another room first so the one door closes before the other door opens, sort of thing, to, to make sure that the clean air is not contaminated in any way. Um, then they started the process, and I think that process lasted something like two years to be completed, of computerizing the whole uh, uh, CRO registry or SB and CRO registry. And as I say, uh, it, it took two years to complete. Um, with it, the Germans brought in a specialized technicians to um, assist, uh, to train our registry people how to operate these computers. So, yeah, the Germans spent a lot of money. Um, funnily enough, one of my colleagues um, in a recent interview also commented on that. Uh, he's a friend of mine, and I've forgotten his name. Keith anyway. Chisnall? Yeah, Keith Chisnall, the very one. And I'd forgotten that Keith and I were colleagues on eDesk. Uh, um, although we, we'd met when, when Keith was uh, at 125 Alpha, um, when he was with uh, Special Projects, um, so he's, he's a friend of mine. Um, and um, he had also worked in, uh, on eDesk on, on, on similar projects at the time. Um, right. Uh, uh, funny enough, Keith had worked with the Americans on, on a few things they did. Now, both MR6 and the CIA um, concentrated on joint operations. And um, basically they operated on specific targets that they had um, uh, that interested them. Like, um, 
I didn't participate in this, but uh, it, it looks like uh, that Keith did. The Americans did a uh, an, an illegal entry into the Angolan embassy. Now, the reason that entry was done is uh, quite simply the Cabinda enclave, which has um, uh, a lot of oil, and uh, American companies were involved in the extraction of that oil. So whatever Angola was up to, especially with the Cubans being so active in Angola, the Americans wanted to know what was going on there. So they did an illegal entry. And um, what was done in that entry is, is quite obvious to me. I, I've done those entries myself. Is um, They would have tried to uh, go to the code machine and break the codes, which is easily done once you have the machine. And in those days, the codes were enacted by um, a ticker tape from, uh, uh, from a fax machine. It used to come out in these yellow ticker tapes. And these the one-time codes had two tapes, you know, one for encoding, one for decoding. And if you got the two tapes of one day and um, you ran them jointly, you could then, in some way, and uh, I'm not a code breaker, but uh, um, uh, I know how it's done. You could thereafter project as to what the next codes would be, would be even though they are one-time codes, yeah? Um, so that would be the first thing they would go for. The second thing they would go for is that they would have a photographer with them. Now, funnily enough, um, in 1980, uh, the late Jake Harper Ronald did join us on eDesk, um, ex-SAS, etc., um, ex-New Scouts. And Jake was, in those days, the official photographer for initially the Barrows, then uh, the Salu Scouts, then the SAS. And um, he was tasked and allowed to take photos of all and anything on, on the externals that those people did. Now, Jack was a friend of mine, and uh, sitting at his house one day, we went through all the uh, photos he had, and there were hundreds of them. And um, this is a record that unfortunately now is, appears to be lost to us, because when Jack passed away, uh, all those records uh, went to his sons, um, and uh, I don't know what his sons have done with these photos. They would have been of no interest to them, but... Uh, yeah, be there as it may. Um, uh, anyway, Jake would have joined uh, all of these uh, exercises as the official e-desk uh, photographer. Um, right. So at the Angolan embassy, uh, they would have taken pictures of any documents they'd found um, and uh, uh, installed uh, listening devices um, clandestine listening devices. In in this case, uh, CIA manufactured listening devices, so they were devices of uh, the latest technical standing and of the highest quality. Yeah? And the second hit they did was uh, they did the same thing with the Cuban embassy. Uh, the Russians uh, had not opened an embassy at that time because the Russians, having supported Zupra, were not permitted an, em an embassy until, I think it was 1982 or 1983. But the East Germans opened up an embassy. Now here, funnily enough, the BND showed no interest in uh, monitoring the East German embassy, but the Brits jumped at the chance. So before um, they took occupation, we opened up a cover company called Mario's Joinery. It's a company I would use uh, frequently after that. And Mario's joinery got the official contract from the owner of uh, uh, the complex that just sold to East Germans, not that the guy had much of a choice, of uh, painting the inside of the building. So that's what we did. And whilst being good boys, we did paint. Well, I hired some painters to do the bloody job I wasn't going to paint. And um, uh, we, we wired that embassy from top to bottom. <sighs> And then we, we, we um, organized the flat as a listening post just down the road. Now, the reasons that Germans didn't want the job became obvious to me after that. It was the most useless exercise we'd ever done because the East Germans obviously must have surmised what we had done. So aside from official politico speak, they never spoke a word of interest at all on, on, on those devices. So the whole thing was... Uh, a useless exercise, aside from the fact that it was interesting for us to have this sort of thing done. 
Um, funny enough, with the Brits, uh, I'm going, I have to go on subject matter. There's just so much that happened to in uh, those years. It's better to stick to subject matters rather than a timeline. Um, it was the Bulawayo Trade Fair. I think the year was 80, I think it was 1983. And the trade fair was either always in April or in May. And they knew that both the Russians and the East Germans had sent a large delegation to the trade fair. So Mario Estonui got the job from the Holiday Inn, not that they had much of a choice again, um, of refurbishing all the rooms on the second floor where we had instructed the uh, management to put all the East German and Russian diplomats. We basically wired the whole second floor of the Holiday Inn, and those bugs are probably still there. And we put bugs in in in, in the bedside lamps, in um, uh, uh, the uh, any electrical appliance you could find, including then furniture. You know, and this is where Mario Stoner comes in. All the bed posts had been wired. You know, um, a lot of the uh, bedside tables had been wired. You know, it was quite a job, and that was a joint operation with MI six. Now, uh, that also meant that. Um, MR6 had to, and uh, 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 some of them actually ended up permanently in Zimbabwe or semi-permanently. They were paid by MR6, but uh, they worked with us, Russian translators. Um, okay, German translators didn't need because I was one. Um, but uh, on the Russian side, we, 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 we just had no just a background. And uh, I remember one of them was a rather pretty lady. Um, okay, by 1983, I was divorced. So um, uh, what it meant that... Uh, yeah, I uh, was open to offers, if you know what I mean. Um, and uh, we got very busy uh, because the chatter in those rooms, for some reason, now these guys felt that being in a hotel, etc., they could talk pretty freely. So uh, we were busy, and uh, I was having like 24-hour days because not only was I running the operation on the Zimbabwean side, uh, incidentally, by then, I was an SIO, it's called Senior Intelligence Officer, which is an equivalent uh, to the rank of Detective Chief Inspector. Um, I actually ended up a 2IC of um, um, EDES became counterintelligence, yeah. And I was 2IC to my crafter in the end when, when I left. Um, yeah, we, we had like 24 days. And um, in order to do all this, I had set up a, a safe house, a flat in Bulawayo, uh, where I would go in any hour that I had free in order to listen to the tapes and transcribe them. And then I thought I had so much to describe, transcribe. I hired, again, a rather pretty young lady from Bulawayo as a typist. So uh, she could do shorthand. So as I was listening, I would dictate to her the translation and she would then uh, type it out on a typewriter. And um, the whole operation lasted the length of the trade fair, I don't know how long it was. But again, in order to keep the whole thing legal, uh, Mario's joinery had one, an official office on the second floor of the uh, uh, Holiday Inn, which um, actually did business. And we had a stand at the trade fair, which also did business. So I had to hire some actual carpenters in order to keep this side of things going, in order to keep the cover going. And we made some money, you know, believe it or not. Um, and because the carpenters were rather good, you know, if we kept Mario's January open as a business, we actually would have turned up quite a nice profit. You know. Okay. Um, again, of interest was, is um, during that op, the SAS was still in existence back then. Um, I, I forget now the personnel who, uh, uh, who had hung around, uh, but one of them was a guy called Fisher. Well, I think was a senior sergeant during the war, something like that. And um, he was the official liaison officer in Bulawayo during the trade fair. I, uh, I, actually, I don't know. I knew yeah. Fisher. He was um, him, uh, Sergeant Fisher, and Corporal Mark Kruger were uh, the two SAS guys in training troop RLI when I was in training troop. Um, okay. Because a, a few of us had signed on to join SAS. But in order to go on recruit course, we, uh, in order to go on SAS selection course, we first had to complete an RLI recruit course. 
And yeah. um, uh, Graham Peak, myself, and Matt Lamb, uh, the Canadian, uh, we went off to join SAS after we passed out of RLI. Yeah. Um, and Sergeant Fisher, I remember he was a, a tall, big guy with dark, curly hair. And he yeah, was, and he was short sighted. He had glasses. He had glasses. Yeah, yeah exactly. Yeah. 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 Very nice. But guy. he was built, very nice. Guy. Yeah, very nice guy. He built like a brick shit house. And funny enough, later, um, okay, as a pastime, I'm going back into 1986, 87. I actually starred in a few movies, but that's another story. Now, Fisher was also in the movie industry then, and he used to run all the transport for the movie companies. So, you know, uh, it's a small world. I wonder what's anyway, I wonder what's become yeah. of him, Hans. I know Corporal Mark Kruger got got killed. I think he was hit with a propeller of a of a, a speedboat on Kariba while they were I don't know doing either carpenta fishing or looking for crocodile eggs or something. Yeah. Uh, I think Mark Kruger was killed in a boating accident, but I don't know what happened. What became a fisher? Have you? Uh, uh, I'm sorry, I lost touch with him after uh, I saw him at the movies. Right. Um, so uh, I can't comment. Anyway, um, I don't know what the powers that be thought the SAS would do at the trade fair, you know. But um, I cooperated with those guys. And, uh, uh, we actually ended up using them to assist us in uh, uh, um, physical surveillance, uh, vehicle surveillance, uh, etc. Um uh, so at least those guys had something to do, you know. Um, yeah, so it was a useful exercise all round. And, uh, um, yeah, then it finished and uh, we went back. Now, in those days, um, it was still the BSAP. Uh, I'm going back to 1980, uh, BSAP, E-Desk. e was situated on the fifth floor, the top floor of Daventry House which is one block away from the uh, main police station by, by, the, by the railway station, yeah. And um, in charge in 1980 was uh, Detective uh, Superintendent Jeffrey Price. Um, his number two was uh, the late DCIO uh, as Detective Chief Inspector Mike Crafter. And then there were a number of DIs, uh, Ian Harries, Alan Bailey, uh, and uh, Phil Hartlebury. Um Hartlebury was in charge of uh, uh, basically both technical and vehicle surveillance, and he was very good at it. Uh, okay, there was no secret that Hartlebury and I were not friends. We did not get on. and um, uh, But he was very good at what he did. And uh, our surveillance uh, team, uh, uh, okay, they had a, a safe house in, uh, I think the house was in Hatfield. We, at, at the house in Hatfield, there was an African team and of course, you have to have a team of of uh, uh, good African surveillance people in order to be able to operate in, in the streets of Harare. And those guys were real professionals um, at both surveillance and counter surveillance. And uh, for technical surveillance, we had a vehicle called, uh, we used to call it the Batmobile. Uh, it was a VW Combi, bright yellow in color with one by window. So black windows, you couldn't see inside. Inside that vehicle, one, was uh, tracking equipment. Now, the tracking equipment was just a, a fish finder from Kariba that had been altered to do the job, and it worked like a treat. And what you did is you had a, a magnetic uh, thing that you could attach to any part of the vehicle, a okay, canister and attach it to any part of the vehicle you were following. And then the fish finder inside, in a range of over one kilometer, uh, would be able to follow this vehicle wherever it went. Secondly, there was a bank of uh, charges uh, um, for the uh, uh, radios we, we used. Um, you could just put the whole radio in and it would recharge the batteries. And third, uh, you had the um, ability to do clandestine photography. Um, what Phil did with us, um, he, he, uh, whenever we had a spare moment, he used to exercise us in in uh, uh, conducting surveillance and counter surveillance. And uh, as I say, he was very good at what he did. Okay, then there were DIs, um, Alan Bailey and Ian Harries. Both of them were about to leave, and Ian Harries trained me up uh, 
to do the job that he had specialized in. And everyone in, in, in the Daventry house had an area they specialized in. Like Hartlebury was surveillance and Ian Harry's was a specialist in what in special branch jargon was called a wet job. Now a wet job comes from the Russian term and it's rather bloody, but uh, a wet job uh, uh, for special branch was nothing more than a clandestine uh, illegal entry into either the premises, the house of a person that we were interested in, or uh, a hotel room of a person that was of interest. Now, 95% of all illegal entries were actually into hotel rooms. In some instances, this was quite easy. Uh, like for the Meekles and the Jamison, the management were on site with us, in fact, in both instances, uh, the managers uh, of those hotels were part of our reservists. So for those hotels, we had a master key. So we could get into any bedroom in those hotels that we could choose. The Mon Monomotapa was a different was, was a different entity, quite simply. Uh, the Monas, we had no contact, see. So at the Monomotapa, we had to make use of what we call the key man. The key man was the owner of uh, um, one of Harari's largest uh, key businesses, no names, not back till the, the right. guys probably still. He, with his skills, would get us entry into the room. He, with his skills, would open any attaché case. The only attaché cases he couldn't open, quite simply, were those with tumbler locks, because three tumblers on either side would use so many combinations, you know, it was a waste of time. And you, you had to leave the room the way you found it. So you couldn't forcibly open. Now, in order to ensure that you left the room the way you found it, we had one of those instrumentic cameras. So before commencing with an illegal entry, we took pictures of the room from all angles with the instrumentic. So we immediately had the pictures to see what was where, how, in what position. And we then used those pictures before exiting to make sure we left the room exactly the way we found it. Okay, so... Say do we, we did an entry in uh, the Monomotapa. There were three people. There was A, the key man, B, Jake Hopper, Ronald, the photographer, and C, me, who would tell Jake what to photograph. Yeah. Um, so uh, Ian Harris taught me to, to do that. And then soon after that, he left. And basically, that became one of my main jobs uh, at, um, at Daventry House. Aside from that, uh, we had, I had the official liaison uh, to do. Um, we, uh, being of German origin and holding a German passport, um, I was uh, designated to do official liaison with the declared BND representatives in the West German embassy. Um, my crafter did the liaison with both the, the British and uh, the Americans. Danny Stenard did the liaison with BOSS, um, uh, Bureau of State Security. Now, <laughs> this job doesn't come without its perks. Um, there was one incident where uh, Danny called me to his office in Red Bricks and he said, right, the uh, declared BOSS representative is going back to South Africa and he'll be uh, taking a trailer with him. Now, in that trailer, it's all sorts of stuff that nobody must see. So you accompany him down to, uh, to uh, Pretoria and come back with him. So I just basically sat in this car, and him and I had a pleasant drive down. And every time we got to a, a ZRP roadblock, I'd flash my, uh, was it CIO by then, my CIO card, and nobody was allowed to search anything, even though this guy being South African, so ZRP guys would have loved to have searched this bloke. But they couldn't. I mean, aside from the fact that diplomatic community, I was there. Because of that, you know, for normal people, the border takes hours. Um, uh, this guy and I were through White Bridge, both sides, in like minutes. You know, we just got to, went to the front of the queue, flashed our cards, and we were let through on both sides. Then we went to Pretoria, into uh, Boss HQ. It's actually a bloody big building, um, uh, so four or five stories. We went into the underground car park. This guy un uh, un unhooked the trailer. And then he gave me the keys to his car. It was a Peugeot 504. And he said, okay, 
you know, got Friday, Saturday, Sunday, where um, I'm here, and you just go and enjoy yourself. He then, he gave me, I think it was two or 3,000 rand. And he said, just bugger off and enjoy yourself. And here's the car, and I'll see you here, 8 o'clock Monday morning. So I buggered off, and I had relatives in, um, in uh, How to Be a Sport. So I went to see my cousins and my aunts and my uncles there, and my grandparents who were still alive then. And then um, with a girl cousin who is rather pretty, I um, I proceeded to, um, what's it called? Sun City. And we spent two days at Sun City, and we gambled, and you know, just had a good time. Um, yeah, and then came back. And on Monday morning, I reported for duty at Boss Headquarters at 8 o'clock, and we went back. Now the trailer is full of goodies. You know, there is... Uh, K, uh, what was it called? KW? Very nice South African wines. KWV. Yeah. KWV, yeah. And um, South African beer, you know. And, of course, the obligatory Amstel, of which we had a cooler box in front. Uh, both made liberal use of it. Um, and uh, tin tuna, you bloody name it. So we, we then went back to Harare, and I thought, you know, jeez, it's nice to be in the unit. Yeah. <laughs> Being a bit of a motorhead, I always take note of the cars I drive. I was then given a three-liter BMW. Um, it's a nice vehicle, um, which was part of the old lots that Jeff Price had been involved with prior to 1980. Um, there were a couple of vehicles. Uh, uh, Mr. Price kept for himself an eight-cylinder British vehicle, what was it called? Uh, I forget now. But a very nice vehicle with all the trimmings. And I was given a BMW, which I was very thankful for. Then starts the whole Jeffrey Price, Price, Evans and Hartlebury and Harper Ronald scenario. <coughs> and he's actually mentioned it in his second interview. Um, okay, what happened is it was New Year's Eve 1981. I personally was not involved in this thing, but became involved later on. Uh, I was at a New Year's Eve party, drunk as a skunk, letting off flares, you name it. Uh, and like four in the morning, some guys got hold of me and they said, listen, the shit hit the fan. A whole lot of guys have been arrested for being South African spies. And then I found out that Harvey and Evans had been arrested. Uh, Jake Harbour Ronald had been arrested now. Jake and I worked a lot together at that time, and uh, I was quite shocked by this. And um, Jeffrey Price had actually fled the country, and he survived. We then subsequently found out that they had been spying for the MID, the uh, Military Intelligence Department of uh, SA. And uh, in South Africa, Jeffrey Price held uh, the rank of colonel in, in, in the South African Army. Uh, uh, Hartlebury ha uh, held the rank of captain, and uh, Colin Evans held the rank of lieutenant. Um, they were held then for interrogation, and they spent three months there um, at the Goromonzi Detention Center. They were held there for three months, and they were interrogated by uh, uh, African uh, 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 operatives of the CIO. Now, in this particular incident, uh, instance, uh, the interrogations were particularly cool. Um, and as I say, they were there for three months. During those three months, they realized that with Jacob or Ronald, they'd gotten the wrong man. And uh, after three months, Jake was released. And like a fool, I took him back without argument. Now, just staying with Jake, um, Jake resented the fact and I don't blame him there, um, resented the fact that he'd been arrested. And Jake had been arrested by mistake because they, in Jake's case, they should have arrested uh, Jeff Price. But they, went, they simply went for the wrong man. And what Jake did after that, unbeknownst to me, he went to the Americans and let himself be recruited by the CIA. And he went to the South Africans and let himself be recruited by the South African MID. So then, in my family, for want of a better word, I had 
a spy. He was spying for both the Yanks and the South Africans. Nice. I didn't. I never found out. Uh, Jake was never found out. It it only became public knowledge when Jake mentioned it in the book that he wrote, uh, Sunday Bloody Sunday, uh, just before he passed away in the UK. Now, staying on that book, um, Jake indulged in quite a few lies in that book, and I need to put this on record. Um, what Jake did in the book, he attributed to himself operations having designed the concepts of these operations himself, when these were my concepts. They weren't his. Yeah. Um, he made me out to be a bit of a fool uh, and uh, uh, started inventing things about failures that I had, according to him, made, um, uh, uh, which simply did not happen. So I, I just need to put this on record uh, that um, you mustn't always believe what you read, as far as I'm concerned anyway. What the reader believes is really up to him, not that I care. Hartley and Evans were then put to trial, and uh, they should have been executed, but uh, Mugabe uh, reduced that particular sentence to life imprisonment. So uh, they basically went to Chikarubi and should have been there for the rest of their natural lives. Lucky for them, when Mandela came into power, um, uh, he uh, in one of the first things that Mandela did, when he came to power, is to uh, request the uh, Mugabe that uh, he should give these people an amnesty. So um, then when Mandela came to power, uh, both Hartlebury and Evans were released, allowed to return to South Africa. Now, um, to my knowledge, and Hartlebury was very good friends with the late Dave Nixon, of course. I've mentioned Dave before. Um, and uh, Dave told me that um, when... Hartley and Evans got to South Africa. Uh, the South African military had continued to pay them for all the years they had been in prison. So they had waiting for him something like 15 years back pay each. It was bloody fortunate. And with his money, uh, what Evans did, uh, what Hartley did, is um, uh, he bought himself a yacht. And he had always been a, a good sailor. He actually had a sailing boat during the war in, in Kariba, and uh, used his time off to just go disappear into Kariba for a few weeks. He bought himself a yacht that was capable to sail around the world. And basically, that's what he did. He disappeared into the oceans, and he was never heard of again. Nobody knows what happened to Hartlebury. He might have ended up somewhere. He might have been killed in a storm. No one knows. What Evans did with his money is actually nothing. Um, Evans became a uh, physical fitness freak. And uh, some friends of mine saw him down in Durban. He continued to live in Durban. And um, they said that Evans was so big, you know, he, he could hardly eat. His arms were so big, you know. Um, but after that, I haven't heard of Evans. Uh, I didn't like Evans either, so it's just as well I never really uh, uh, saw them again. Enter King Zog. King Zog is uh, the ex-king of Albania. Um, he visited Rhodesia during the war. Um, now, Zog was introduced to our foreign minister, uh, what was his name, Van der Bell, by a German right-wing politician from Bavaria called Strauss. And basically, uh, Zog visited Rhodesia. He had an, uh, he had an, uh, an, an appointment with Ian Smith, and I remember him being interviewed on the main news on uh, uh, Rhodesian television. So of course, a very tall man. He was about the height of a of a, a pro basketball player from the USA. Um, and his mission in life was to reclaim Albania for himself as a kingdom and take it away from the communists. So that's what he wanted to achieve. And his chance came about in 1980. Um, Zog was introduced to uh, the late Dave Fowler, and uh, Fowler had a sidekick called Cliff Parents. Parents during the war had been uh, stationed with special forces, and Parents was a scrounger of note. You know, if you wanted it, Parents got it. Whether it was a case of whiskey or an RPD, uh, Parents will get it for you, for a price, of course. He was a success successful businessman, and in fact, 
he was uh, one of the reservists, uh, European reservists that we had at Eders. Yeah. Cliff and I became good friends. Um, and what parents and uh, Dave Fowler had uh, started with Zog, they've done a deal. Uh, I only got to know about it later, and uh, you'll see why just now. Is they filled two five ton trucks with all the old weapons and ammo, and you bloody name it. A, from all the SFA in Mosambura and, uh, and uh, Chinamura, and B, from what was left of the uh, Special Forces Armory. With part of, part of that, um, Cliff and I actually took to his cottage in Yanga, and there were three metal trunks that uh, Cliff and I filled up with weapons and ammo, and we buried them on his, uh, on his um, estate. Uh, for you never know, yeah. So they, with these trucks, they get to the border and they've arranged passage through the border post on either side, no problems for them. And just before Bulawayo, ah, ah, just before Pretoria, they hit a roadblock they weren't expecting. And in those hills just north of Pretoria, uh, they actually called the Hartebeersport Range uh, because Hartebeersport Dam is, is a little bit further down the drag. Uh, uh, there was the uh, South African Police Dog Section. And Dog Section, just as a general exercise, there's a roadblock on the highway right near Pretoria. And they hit, the uh, father hit this roadblock and he panicked. And when they asked that he open his truck, he just turned around to them and said, I've come to donate these weapons and ammo to you, to any members of the SADF, and you are the first ones I come across. So here, the weapons are used. Ten tons of bloody weaponry. Yeah? Of course, this is in the days before Angola, etc. So, you know, AKs and this sort of thing were like hen's teeth. Um, okay, I'm doing another aside now. Um, Cliff and I ran a separate operation to this where he had a VW Combi. We used to smuggle weapons from, uh, from Zimbabwe to South Africa uh, just to make a few extra bucks on the side. And I had acquired in 1979 a Dragunov sniper rifle. And you know, to this day, I regret having sold this rifle because it would have made a perfect bloody hunting weapon, but there you are, you know, I sold it. And... Uh, I sold this rifle uh, to uh, a banker in uh, Johannesburg who, who was a collector. And back in 1980, he gave me 3,000 rand for that weapon. Now, I was already uh, separated from any, so I was a single man. So I took that 3,000 rand, which was a fortune back then, and I blew it in Durban on a two-week holiday. That's only that it was two. Okay. Going back to those weapons. So those weapons now end up at the SA dog section armory. Now, enter me and Cliff. They approached Cliff, having found out that he'd been part of the deal. And I said, listen, we've got all those weapons and we don't know how to use them. So Cliff said, okay. He actually didn't either, but I did. So he said, okay, we will come down and train you. So Cliff and I went down to SA police dog section. And I think it was 10 days or two weeks. And they had like a huge estate there, several thousand hectares. So we could do what we want. Um, we trained them on the use of these weapons. And they had a 75 mil recoilless. It was actually the same recoilless that we captured in, uh, in Shinamura. But what Cliff had done, he'd found quite a few rounds of ammo at the uh, Special Forces Armory. So there was enough ammo to go around. There was 12.7s. There was... Uh, RBG 7s, there was PKMs, there was RPDs, you bloody name it, uh, several hundred AKs. So we spent the next few weeks training the SAP how to use all these weapons. Now, in return, they gave us five carpet treatment. Treatment. We each got a house. Uh, they gave us each a car and a driver, mind you, a driver. So we were driven everywhere. I suppose they wanted to see what we were doing, but I wasn't really interested in doing anything. But we ate in the best restaurants, etc. We we were treated like kings. So it ended up quite a nice sort of interlude, you know. <laughs> right. Um, 
Of course, King Zog was heavily disappointed. We actually then met him, and he he'd uh, uh, he'd actually got a bonded warehouse in Joburg in anticipation of these weapons, and he had a house in four ways. Now, back in 1980, four ways was actually still outside Janusburg, although you go to Joburg today, you don't know where Joburg finishes and four ways starts. It's all one city. But then it was very really much a separate place. And the house he was staying at was a large, sprawling place. And I think it was eight Albanians who had served in the Rhodesian Armed Forces were there as his personal bodyguards, all already armed with AKs, etc., and doing the Albanian salutes, whatever that was. Uh, and of course, poor old Zog was quite disappointed, but hey, what can I do? So Albania stayed communist. <laughs> yeah. Um, right, what happened next? John, uh, good talking to you again. And yeah, all the best, my friend. Thanks. Okay. Thanks, Hans. Very interesting. Okay. Okay, cheers for now. Cheers. Bye. Bye.